the good is something that's equilibrated across multiple levels of being and multiple time frames simultaneously and it isn't necessarily that you know what that is going to be at any given moment but you can orient yourself so that's the state that you want to exist in and i can tell you as far as i can tell when you exist in that state even moment by moment your life is imbued with a sense of meaning and that sense of meaning can help you transcend suffering uh, the philosopher nietzsche said he who has a why can bear any how he who has a why can bear anyhow. And so Nietzsche's idea was that if there was purpose in your life of sufficient grandeur, that not only could the suffering in life be accepted, but maybe it could even be appreciated. Like it, it could be that you're willing to bear the burden of being because of the exciting things that you can do with being, the things you can build and the things that you can bring about. And that might be the highest imaginable state of being. And that's that's a form of paradise, but it, it's not a paradise that you attain by transforming others. It's a paradise that you attain by transforming yourself. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And it's a very frightening thing to do because it means that you're you're retooling your soul. And that's that's a job for a real, that's the job for a forthright and honorable person. And it, it's an exciting enough task so that it will keep you occupied for the rest of your life. And then magical things will happen to you while you're while you're doing it. And the world will arrange itself around you in the most wonderful way, in a musical way, so that every part of what you're experiencing plays off against every other part in a manner that has meaning embedded in every aspect of it. And you experience that, by the way. You experience that when you listen to a piece of music that you love. Music represents that. And that's why people, it's why mu music nourishes the soul, why it's the highest form of art, at least in my opinion. So you have to live your life as if being is a symphony and you're playing you're playing your instrumental part. Once you orient yourself, then you have an obligation, I would say, an obligation to the development of your soul to speak the truth. You have to be oriented properly, though, because the truth is, is something that exists in service to an ideal, an ideal of sorts. Then you can imagine that you could use your language two ways. You can use your language to manipulate the world and to extract from it what you want. So, for example, maybe you go out on a date with someone and you decide that the end goal of the date is to have a sexual partner for the night and then you can craft your language to manipulate the person into providing you with you with what you want and that's like an instrumental use of language but the problem with that there's many problems with that but one of them is is that what if your idea about what you should want is wrong like maybe that's not the way to treat someone that you're on a date with out on a date with maybe maybe you're minimizing and reducing the interactions between you from what could be um, a healthy and elevated state of interaction and discourse to something that's that basically the pursuit of impulsive pleasure and not maybe that's not good for you next week and the week after and a month down the road maybe orienting yourself towards impulsive pleasure is a very bad idea remember what happens in pinocchio pinocchio goes to pleasure island and pleasure island is a place where impulsive pleasures can be had at, at a moment's notice but what pinocchio discovers along with jiminy cricket that pleasure island is run by masked totalitarians they're they're all dressed in black you remember and they're they're turning the children and adolescents who are on pleasure island they're depriving them of their voice turning them into braying jackasses and preparing to sell them as slaves to the salt mines and so there's an implication in that story that the pursuit of impulsive pleasure is one route to totalitarianism and slavery and, and i believe that so perhaps orienting your language towards the gathering of impulsive pleasure is a miss is a misuse of, of your highest gift, your, the gift of logos, the gift of communication. The alternative is to orient yourself towards the highest good, as we already described, and then speak the truth. Which and you can you can tell when you're doing that because, or you can tell when you're not doing that because if you're if you're not telling the truth, if you're using someone else's words, you're being manipulated in a sense by forces that are behind the scenes. You're not using your own words. You're the puppet of an ideology or another thinker or your own impulsive desires. And you can tell when you're speaking like that because it makes you feel weak. It makes you feel weak and ashamed. And you can localize that feeling physiologically. If you listen to yourself talk, you can tell when, when you're speaking properly, 
you will experience a feeling of integration and strength. And when you're speaking in a deceitful or manipulative manner, you'll feel that you're starting to come apart at the seams. And what you need to do is practice only saying things that make you feel stronger. And that'll mean to begin with that you'll notice that almost everything you say is a lie. It's either a lie or someone else's words. It's very hard to find your own words, but you don't actually exist until you have your own words. So, okay, so then you, you try to teach yourself how to speak your own truth and you listen to other people while you're doing that because they can help you shape and correct your words. They'll react to them badly if you formulate your ideas badly and if you listen and pay attention then you can learn to formulate your words more and more clearly and accurately and that makes you more and more powerful. It makes you, it, it gives you more and more authority which is the, which is the beneficial form of power. Okay, so you do that and then you have to make a decision of faith and that's basically well that you can either either use your language to manipulate the world and make it do what you want or you can use your language to try to articulate the truth as carefully as you possibly can and then you can see what happens you have to let go of your desire for the for the consequences that you want you have to assume that if you speak the truth the results are the best that is possible under the circumstances and so it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting way of living in some sense, some sense. It's like continually walking off a cliff because you don't know what's going to happen next if all you do is say what you think. You know, and maybe you're at work and you say what you think and you get fired and you think, oh my God, that's a terrible catastrophe. But maybe it's not because maybe if you're working somewhere and you have to lie to maintain your job, maybe you shouldn't be there. Maybe it's deadening your soul and damaging you in some permanent manner and making you corrupt. And so... You have to orient yourself, you have to speak the truth as carefully as you can. You have to listen to others so that you correct your speech. And then you have to allow the consequences that ensue to unfold as they will. That's the ultimate act of faith, I would say. And that's what you do if you belong to Truth University. All right, so more practically speaking, then you should educate yourself. And it's not that easy to do now because you have to find people who can actually tell you mostly what to read and, and maybe also how to write because writing is a way of of formulating your thoughts ever more precisely. That's why you go to university to learn how to write. If you learn, if you know how to write, you can think. If you can think and speak and communicate in writing, you're you're unbelievably powerful in the authority manner because arguments move the world forward. And if your arguments are tight and well constructed and lucid and well edited and carefully thought through, and you have five rationales for everything that you're doing which is what happens if you learn to write properly, then you're like a force of nature, man. No one can take you down. And that's one of the things that people aren't taught about why you go get educated, especially in the humanities. Humanities education, if it's real, organizes your psyche, grounds you, puts you on a, a rock and makes you a force to contend with. But you have to read the right people. And so, and those are the great, they're, they're the great people of the past. In my list, they're the great men of the past. And that's just how it is. And so here's who I would recommend. I put reading lists up at jordanbpeterson.com. There's two of them. And the people that I recommend primarily are their books written by the following list of people. Fyodor Dostoevsky, Leo Tolstoy, who I think perhaps the greatest novelist the world has ever seen. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, another great Russian novelist. I don't know what it is about the Russians, but man, they produce, they produce writers that are in, incomparable. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago, where he analyzed the Soviet prison camp system that arose after the Leninist revolution in the second decade of the 20th century, and details in ab absolutely precisely how the tenets of Marxism, the Marxist tenets that are supposed to free everyone and change the world, produced legislation that was, that was absolutely murderous in its consequences, and Solzhenitsyn painstakingly traces the logical pathway from the original Marxist principles to the legislation, to the to the genocides. Because you'll hear people who are basically Marxists say things like, well, true Marxism never existed. And Solzhenitsyn took that that argument apart in the in the mid 70s. And and the Gulag Archipelago was an intellectual bomb. It 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 demolished any credibility that Marxism had to intellectual respectability. You have to read the book. The book is about the central issue in our culture at the moment. If you don't read it, you're not informed. You can't participate in the debate except as a puppet. And so I wouldn't recommend participating in this debate as a puppet because you don't know who's behind the scenes pulling the strings.